Part seven of Tom Jones being Book two, chapters seven, eight, and nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Book two, chapters seven, eight, and nine. Chapter seven. A short sketch of that felicity which prudent couples may extract from hatred with a short apology for those people who overlook imperfections in their friends. Though the captain had effectually demolished poor Partridge, yet had he not reaped the harvest he hoped for, which was to turn the foundling out of Mr. Allworthy's house. On the contrary, that gentleman grew every day fonder of little Tommy, as if he intended to counterbalance his severity to the father, with extraordinary fondness and affection towards the son. This a good deal soured the captain's temper, as did all the other daily instances of Mr. Allworthy's generosity. For he looked on all such largesses to be diminutions of his own wealth. In this we have said he did not agree with his wife, nor indeed in anything else. For though an affection placed on the understanding is by many wise persons thought more durable than that which is founded on beauty, yet it happened otherwise in the present case. Nay, the understandings of this couple were their principal bone of contention, and one great cause of many quarrels, which from time to time arose between them, and which at last ended on the side of the lady in a sovereign contempt for her husband and on the husband's, in an utter abhorrence of his wife. As these had both exercised their talents chiefly in the study of divinity, this was, from their first acquaintance, the most common topic of conversation between them. The captain, like a well-bred man, had before marriage always given up his opinion to that of the lady, and this not in the clumsy, awkward manner of a conceited blockhead, who, while he civilly yields to a superior in an argument, is desirous of being still known to think himself in the right. The captain, on the contrary, though one of the proudest fellows in the world, so absolutely yielded the victory to his antagonist, that she, who had not the least doubt of his sincerity, retired always from the dispute with an admiration of her own understanding, and a love for his. But though this complaisance to one whom the captain thoroughly despised, was not so uneasy to him as it would have been had any hopes of preferment made it necessary to show the same submission to a hoadly or to some other of great reputation in the science, yet even this cost him too much to be endured without some motive. Matrimony, therefore, having removed all such motives, he grew weary of this condescension, and began to treat the opinions of his wife with that haughtiness and insolence which none but those who deserve some contempt themselves can bestow, and those only who deserve no contempt can bear. When the first torrent of tenderness was over, and when, in the calm and long interval between the fits, reason began to open the eyes of the lady, and she saw this alteration of behaviour in the captain, who at length answered all her arguments only with pish and pure, she was far from enduring the indignity with a tame submission. Indeed, it at first so highly provoked her, that it might have produced some tragical event, had it not taken a more harmless turn, by filling her with the utmost contempt for her husband's understanding, which somewhat qualified her hatred towards him, though of this likewise she had a pretty moderate share. The captain's hatred to her was of a purer kind, for as to any imperfections in her knowledge or understanding, he no more despised her for them than for her not being six feet high. In his opinion of the female sex, he exceeded the moroseness of Aristotle himself, he looked on a woman as on an animal of domestic use, of somewhat higher consideration than a cat, since her offices were of rather more importance, but the difference between these two was in his estimation so small, that in his marriage contracted with Mr. Allworthy's lands and tenements, it would have been pretty equal which of them he had taken into the bargain. 
and yet so tender was his pride that it felt the contempt which his wife now began to express towards him, and this, added to the surfeit he had before taken of her love, created in him a degree of disgust and abhorrence, perhaps hardly to be exceeded. One situation only of the married state is excluded from pleasure, and that is a state of indifference. But as many of my readers, I hope, know what an exquisite delight there is in conveying pleasure to a beloved object, so some few, I am afraid, may have experienced the satisfaction of tormenting one we hate. It is, I apprehend, to come at this latter pleasure, that we see both sexes often give up that ease in marriage which they might otherwise possess, though their mate was never so disagreeable to them. Hence the wife often puts on fits of love and jealousy, nay, even denies herself any pleasure, to disturb and prevent those of her husband. And he again in return puts frequent restraints on himself, and stays at home in company which he dislikes, in order to confine his wife to what she equally detests. Hence, too, must flow those tears which a widow sometimes so plentifully sheds over the ashes of a husband, with whom she led a life of constant disquiet and turbulency, and whom now she can never hope to torment any more. But if any couple enjoyed this pleasure, it was at present experienced by the captain and his lady. It was always a sufficient reason to either of them to be obstinate in any opinion that the other had previously asserted the contrary. If the one proposed any amusement, the other constantly objected to it. They never loved or hated, commended or abused the same person. And for this reason, as the captain looked with an evil eye on the little foundling, his wife began now to caress it almost equally with her own child. The reader will be apt to conceive that this behaviour between the husband and wife did not greatly contribute to Mr. Allworthy's repose, as it tended so little to that serene happiness which he had proposed to all three from this alliance. But the truth is, though he might be a little disappointed in his sanguine expectations, yet he was far from being acquainted with the whole matter, for, as the captain was from certain obvious reasons much on his guard before him, the lady was obliged, for fear of her brother's displeasure, to pursue the same conduct. In fact, it is possible for a third person to be very intimate, nay, even to live long in the same house, with a married couple who have any tolerable discretion, and not even guess at the sour sentiments which they bear to each other. For though the whole day may be sometimes too short for hatred as well as for love, yet the many hours which they naturally spend together apart from all observers supply people of tolerable moderation with such ample opportunity for the enjoyment of either passion that if they love they can support being a few hours in company without toying or if they hate without spitting in each other's faces it is possible however that mr allworthy saw enough to render him a little uneasy for we are not always to conclude that a wise man is not hurt, because he doth not cry out and lament himself, like those of a childish or effeminate temper. But indeed it is possible he might see some faults in the captain, without any uneasiness at all, for men of true wisdom and goodness are contented to take persons and things as they are, without complaining of their imperfections or attempting to amend them. They can see a fault in a friend, a relation, or an acquaintance, without ever mentioning it to the parties themselves or to any others, and this often without the least lessening of their affection. Indeed, unless great discernment be tempered with this overlooking disposition, we ought never to contract friendship but with a degree of folly which we can deceive. For I hope my friends will pardon me when I declare I know none of them without a fault, and I should be sorry if I could imagine I had any friend who could not see mine. Forgiveness of this kind we give and demand in turn. It is an exercise of friendship, and perhaps none of the least pleasant. And this forgiveness we must bestow without desire of amendment. There is perhaps no surer mark of folly than an attempt to correct the natural infirmities of those we love. The finest composition of human nature, as well as the finest china, may have a flaw in it. And this, I am afraid, in either case, is equally incurable, 
though, nevertheless, the pattern may remain of the highest value. Upon the whole, then, Mr. Allworthy certainly saw some imperfections in the captain, but as this was a very artful man, and eternally upon his guard before him, these appeared to him no more than blemishes in a good character, which his goodness made him overlook, and his wisdom prevented him from discovering to the captain himself. Very different would have been his sentiments had he discovered the whole, which perhaps would in time have been the case had the husband and wife long continued this kind of behaviour to each other. But this kind fortune took effectual means to prevent, by forcing the captain to do that which rendered him again dear to his wife, and restored all her tenderness and affection towards him. CHAPTER Eight, A RECIPE TO REGAIN THE LOST AFFECTIONS OF A WIFE, WHICH HATH NEVER BEEN KNOWN TO FAIL IN THE MOST DESPERATE CASES. The captain was made large amends for the unpleasant minutes which he passed in the conversation of his wife, and which were as few as he could contrive to make them, by the pleasant meditations he enjoyed when alone. These meditations were entirely employed on Mr. Allworthy's fortune, for first he exercised much thought in calculating as well as he could the exact value of the whole, which calculations he often saw occasion to alter in his own favour and secondly, and chiefly, he pleased himself with intended alterations in the house and gardens, and in projecting many other schemes, as well for the improvement of the estate as of the grandeur of the place. For this purpose he applied himself to the studies of architecture and gardening, and read over many books on both these subjects. For these sciences, indeed, employed his whole time, and formed his only amusement. He at last completed a most excellent plan, and very sorry we are that it is not in our power to present it to our reader, since even the luxury of the present age, I believe, would hardly match it. It had indeed, in a superlative degree, the two principal ingredients which serve to recommend all great and noble designs of this nature, for it required an immoderate expense to execute, and a vast length of time to bring it to any sort of perfection. The former of these, the immense wealth of which the captain supposed Mr. Allworthy possessed, and which he thought himself sure of inheriting, promised very effectually to supply, and the latter, the soundness of his own constitution and his time of life, which was only what is called middle age, removed all apprehension of his not living to accomplish. Nothing was wanting to enable him to enter upon the immediate execution of this plan, but the death of Mr. Allworthy, in calculating which he had employed much of his own algebra, besides purchasing every book extant that treats of the value of lives, reversions, etc., from all which he satisfied himself that, as he had every day a chance of this happening, so had he more than an even chance of its happening within a few years. But while the captain was one day busied in deep contemplations of this kind, one of the most unlucky as well as unseasonable accidents happened to him. The utmost malice of fortune could indeed have contrived nothing so cruel, so mal a propos, so absolutely destructive to all his schemes. In short, not to keep the reader in long suspense, just at the very instant when his heart was exulting in meditations on the happiness which would accrue to him by Mr. Allworthy's death, he himself died of an apoplexy. This unfortunately befell the captain as he was taking his evening walk by himself, so that nobody was present to lend him any assistance, if indeed any assistance could have preserved him. He took, therefore, measure of that proportion of soil which was now become adequate to all his future purposes, and he lay dead on the ground, a great, though not a living, example of the truth of that observation of Horace. Tu secanda marmora loca sub ipsum faunus et sepulcri immemor struis domus. Which sentiment I shall thus give to the English reader. You provide the noblest materials for building, when a pickaxe and a spade are only necessary, and build houses of five by a hundred feet, forgetting that of six by two. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 
a proof of the infallibility of the foregoing recipe in the lamentations of the widow, with other suitable decorations of death, such as physicians, etc., and an epitaph in the true style. Mr. Allworthy, his sister, and another lady were assembled at the accustomed hour in the supper-room, where, having waited a considerable time longer than usual, Mr. Allworthy first declared he began to grow uneasy at the captain's stay, for he was always most punctual at his meals, and gave orders that the bell should be rung without the doors, and especially towards those walks which the captain was wont to use. All these summons proving ineffectual, for the captain had by perverse accident betaken himself to a new walk that evening, Mrs. Blifil declared she was seriously frightened, upon which the other lady, who was one of her most intimate acquaintance, and who well knew the true state of her affections, endeavoured all she could to pacify her, telling her, to be sure, she could not help being uneasy, but that she should hope the best, that perhaps the sweetness of the evening had enticed the captain to go farther than his usual walk, or he might be detained at some neighbour's. Mrs. Blifil answered, No, she was sure some accident had befallen him, for that he would never stay out without sending her word, as he must know how uneasy it would make her. The other lady, having no other argument to use, betook herself to the entreaties usual on such occasions, and begged her not to frighten herself, for it might be of very ill consequence to her own health, and filling out a very large glass of wine, advised, and at last prevailed with her, to drink it. Mr. Allworthy now returned into the parlour, for he had been himself in search of the captain. His countenance sufficiently showed the consternation he was under, which, indeed, had a good deal deprived him of speech. But as grief operates variously on different minds, so the same apprehension which depressed his voice elevated that of Mrs. Blifil. She now began to bewail herself in very bitter terms, and floods of tears accompanied her lamentations, which the lady, her companion, declared she could not blame, but at the same time dissuaded her from indulging, attempting to moderate the grief of her friend by philosophical observations on the many disappointments to which human life is daily subject, which, she said, was a sufficient consideration to fortify our minds against any accidents, how sudden or terrible soever. She said her brother's example ought to teach her patience, who, though indeed he could not be supposed as much concerned as herself, yet was doubtless very uneasy, though his resignation to the divine will had restrained his grief within due bounds. "'Mention not my brother,' said Mrs. Blifil. I alone am the object of your pity. What are the errors of friendship to what a wife feels on these occasions? Oh, he is lost! Somebody hath murdered him! I shall never see him more! Here a torrent of tears had the same consequence with what the suppression had occasioned to Mr. Allworthy, and she remained silent. At this interval a servant came running in out of breath, and cried out the captain was found and before he could proceed farther he was followed by two more, bearing the dead body between them. Here the curious reader may observe another diversity in the operations of grief, for as Mr. Allworthy had been before silent from the same cause which had made his sister vociferous, so did the present sight, which drew tears from the gentleman, put an entire stop to those of the lady, who first gave a violent scream, and presently after fell into a fit. The room was soon full of servants, some of whom, with the lady visitant, were employed in the care of the wife, and others, with Mr. Allworthy, assisted in carrying off the captain to a warm bed, where every method was tried in order to restore him to life. And glad should we be, could we inform the reader, that both these bodies had been attended with equal success, for those who undertook the care of the lady succeeded so well, that after the fit had continued a decent time, she again revived to their great satisfaction. But as to the captain, all experiments of bleeding, chafing, dropping, etc., proved ineffectual. Death, that inexorable judge, had passed sentence on him, and refused to grant him a reprieve though two doctors who arrived and were feed at one and the same instant were his counsel. 
These two doctors, whom to avoid any malicious applications we shall distinguish by the names of Dr. Y and Dr. Z, having felt his pulse to wit Dr. Y his right arm and Dr. Z his left, both agreed that he was absolutely dead, but as to the distemper or cause of his death they differed, Dr. Y holding that he died of an apoplexy and Dr. Z of an epilepsy. Hence arose a dispute between the learned men, in which each delivered the reasons of their several opinions. These were of such equal force, that they served both to confirm either doctor in his own sentiments, and made not the least impression on his adversary. To say the truth, every physician almost hath his favourite disease, to which he ascribes all the victories obtained over human nature. The gout, the rheumatism, the stone, the gravel, and the consumption— have all their several patrons in the faculty, and none more than the nervous fever, or the fever on the spirits. And here we may account for those disagreements in opinion concerning the cause of a patient's death, which sometimes occur between the most learned of the college, and which have greatly surprised that part of the world who have been ignorant of the fact we have above asserted. The reader may perhaps be surprised that instead of endeavouring to revive the patient, the learned gentleman should fall immediately into a dispute on the occasion of his death, but in reality all such experiments had been made before their arrival, for the captain was put into a warm bed, had his veins scarified, his forehead chafed, and all sorts of strong drops applied to his lips and nostrils. The physicians, therefore, finding themselves anticipated in everything they ordered, were at a loss how to apply that portion of time which it is usual and decent to remain for their fee, and were therefore necessitated to find some subject or other for discourse, and what could more naturally present itself than that before mentioned. Our doctors were about to take their leave when Mr. Allworthy, having given over the captain, and acquiesced in the divine will, began to inquire after his sister, whom he desired them to visit before their departure. This lady was now recovered of her fit, and to use the common phrase, as well as could be expected for one in her condition. The doctors, therefore, all previous ceremonies being complied with, as this was a new patient, attended according to desire, and laid hold on each of her hands, as they had before done on those of the corpse. The case of the lady was in the other extreme from that of her husband, for as he was past all the assistance of physic, so in reality she required none. There is nothing more unjust than the vulgar opinion by which physicians are misrepresented as friends to death. On the contrary, I believe, if the number of those who recover by physic could be opposed to that of the martyrs to it, the former would rather exceed the latter. Nay, some are so cautious on this head, that to avoid a possibility of killing the patient, they abstain from all methods of curing and prescribe nothing, but what can neither do good nor harm. I have heard some of these, with great gravity, deliver it as a maxim that nature should be left to do her own work, while the physician stands by, as it were, to clap her on the back and encourage her when she doth well. So little, then, did our doctors delight in death, that they discharged the corpse after a single fee, but they were not so disgusted with their living patient, concerning whose case they immediately agreed, and fell to prescribing with great diligence. Whether, as the lady had at first persuaded her physicians to believe her ill, they had now in return persuaded her to believe herself so, I will not determine, but she continued a whole month with all the decorations of sickness. During this time she was visited by physicians, attended by nurses, and received constant messages from her acquaintance to inquire after her health. At length the decent time for sickness and immoderate grief being expired, the doctors were discharged, and the lady began to see company, being altered only from what she was before, by that colour of sadness in which she had dressed her person and countenance. The captain was now interred, and might perhaps have already made a large progress towards oblivion, had not the friendship of Mr. Allworthy taken care to preserve his memory by the following epitaph which was written by a man of as great genius as integrity, and one who perfectly well knew the captain. 
Here lies in expectation of a joyful rising, the body of Captain John Bliffill. London had the honour of his birth, Oxford of his education. His parts were an honour to his profession and to his country, his life to his religion and human nature. He was a dutiful son, a tender husband, an affectionate father, a sincere friend, a devout Christian, and a good man. His inconsolable widow hath erected this stone, the monument of his virtues, and of her affection. End of chapter 9 End of book 2